welcome to our informal session and we'll go ahead and get going with the city manager's briefings and uh, Mr. Dehaney, I understand we have a uh, modification. Yes, Mr. Mayor, as we discussed earlier this morning, I asked that um, we could take some time and bypass the interim financial update which council has been provided just so Deborah, who's in Richmond right now at the first day for the General Assembly can give an update on a couple of the bills that were done before. Um, the General Assembly, because some of them impact the city of Virginia Beach, and we'd like to get a sense from council if they want us to take a position any way, shape, or form on those bills before they move any further in the process. Okay, and the other thing is, you know, being how we're doing this virtually, it may be prudent to let Ms. Bryan go ahead and get through her entire speech in this way. You know, when council members have questions, you know, it'll be a lot cleaner at the end. Mm -hmm. And council, I apologize. As you all know, the pace of the General Assembly is not one that is conducive for council meetings and things like <coughs> that. So Deborah, when she got the information, she prepared a quick briefing as much as possible. You probably did not get a chance to read this, but Deborah's going to go over these items to solicit your feedback and input. All right. I think with that, we can go to Deborah. Welcome, Deb. I know I'm not supposed to say that. Sorry, Amanda. <clears throat> well, good afternoon, uh, Mayor, members of City Council, City Manager Dehaney, um, coming to you from the lovely VML building here um, at the State Capitol. And as uh, the City Manager mentioned, I uh, on Friday, we received kind of our first quick um, brief from our lobbyist firm on what um, other bills may be of interest to you. Um, I sent that out late Friday and have received a couple of inquiries. So in the interest of time, and if you want to direct uh, any position be taken, I sent out something last night and of uh, there's about four, pretty much four main bills that um, I've been asked by some of you to give more information on. So uh, let's take the uh, quick, the uh, low hanging fruit first. There's a, a House Bill 1031 that was introduced by Delegate Glenn Davis. It has not yet been assigned a committee, um, but for this one, uh, it, it, all it does is if the city council happens to pass an ordinance to add an additional city council member at large, then the school board must also do the same. So that doesn't uh, affect us too much. The second part of that is that any local elected official in office on the effective date of court ordered redistricting plan must be allowed to complete their term. And um, I will leave it to um, legal as to opine whether this is already what the code requires um, and the statement of adding the word redistricting, if that changes anything for all of you. Uh, but that's the first one. I will tell you this morning, I heard from the school's lobbyist um, who is also here, Joel Andrus, and I have not given, they, they um, have requested that the city uh, let schools know how they feel about this. Um, and I have told them I'm waiting until after this meeting to give them any feedback. The second one um, I wanted to go over was House Bill 98, Senate Bill 380, their companion bills. Um, it, this was introduced in the Senate um, by Senator McDougal and in the House by Delegate McNamara. Um, this is the grocery tax, which we knew was coming. Um, and I, I believe you've already have a, a pretty much a handle on this. It is a lot more um, complicated than um, just taking uh, getting rid of the grocery tax. So as far as analysis on that, um, I will leave that to our tax professionals. But basically uh, where they are in the process is that House, both of them, uh, the House bill and the Senate bill have been referred to their uh, respective money committees and will be taken up within the next um, could be week, could be two weeks. And, and that is uh, one of the other things that I wanted to mention. As you all know, the funnel here, we started out with over 2,000 bills. Many of those bills may not even make it out of committee or will be combined with other bills. So we have time, but we don't have time. Um, when what I mean by that is by the time any of these bills make it all the way through the process, um, could be could be weeks or could be towards the end of the of at least crossover. But also, if there is a position that you want to take um, when they are in committees at the beginning is the best place to do that and position or if you would like to have any kind of a revision or input. Um, so that's the, the grocery tax. And you will note that that um, the grocery tax takes care of all state, regional and local taxes, which um, was not necessarily in the original. Um, the third one that I wanted to tell you about was a, a bill that HRT, I think all of you 
have probably gotten um, information from HRT already. They are lobbying very hard against this and opposing it, um, as are a lot of our uh, other local jurisdictions around us. Um, there's House Bill 978 by Delegate Durant, and he's from uh, the Fredericksburg area. Senate Bill 363, Senator Stort, who's in the Fredericksburg, Spotsylvania area. There's another bill that accompanies that, which is Senate Bill 512 um, by Senator Suderline, who's in the Roanoke um, area. So you will note, as the HRT did in all of their talking points, none of those um, districts are anywhere near Hampton Roads. Yet what they're trying to do is um, get rid of the uh, $20 million that has been allocated to Hampton Roads um, within this uh, legislation back in 2020 and, uh, and put it back into the, the coffers and then distribute it out. Um, basically, the, uh, there's a lot of uh, information about this one that I think um, uh, our staff can certainly give you. Um, but from what the news about it around here and the reason that they are doing that is because um, at the time when it was um, promulgated, it took all the money from all of the other areas and basically took $20 million out of the pot. Um, uh, Northern Virginia already had a dedicated funding source for their transportation, but Hampton Roads did not. So this $20 million provides the dedicated funding source for HRT. Um, the recordation tax, if it came out of this and back to Virginia Beach, um, that is something that our um, budget and uh, uh, tax people will have to tell us what that implication is. So um, that's really the, uh, the gist of that one. And then the one I think that um, is obviously aimed at um, the city of Virginia Beach that you may be most interested in is Senate Bill 602, which um, was introduced by Senator DeSteff. And basically what that does is take everything that the city of Virginia Beach has done with short-term rentals and undoes it. Um, the, so I met with Senator Steph this morning and uh, the first thing that this uh, bill does is on one of the lines it adds the word house to an STR definition, which is um, probably benign. But then on line 43, it adds a section that says, except as otherwise provided in this section, and I'm paraphrasing, a locality cannot require or allow neighbors uh, neighbors of a neighborhood to authorize STRs, which would, um, in essence, cancel Virginia Beach's requirement that is necessary for the overlay districts to get your neighbors to sign on. And two, um, the locality would not be able to impose restrictions that don't apply to other properties. Properties isn't defined, but uh, Senator Steph said what he, he means by properties is non-STRs. So if your neighbor is uh, an analogous type of house and they do not have a short-term rental and the short-term rental is right next door, um, they have to be treated equally in terms of how many people, if, if the neighbor next door can have six people living in the house, then the SDR should also be able to have six people. If they only need one or two parking spaces, then the SDR should only need one or two. That's um, what he's getting at there. And then the third is to restrict no allowances for restricting the geographic location. So basically that's um, current Sandbridge, there's no overlay districts or anything like that. Um, there's been several uh, calls that I've gotten on this one from uh, different home associations, the Home Builders Association, they're neutral on it. Um, the uh, Realtors Association and uh, BML and Baco, everyone is very, um, really wondering what Virginia Beach is going to do about this one. Um, but I can tell you that um, Senator Steph also said that companies like Atkinson Realty and Sandbridge Realty um, that are have long histories in Virginia Beach are will basically go out of business and that he believes that the city's current scheme for short-term rentals will be putting those businesses out of business. Um, what he'd like to do is um, slow this uh, down. He doesn't intend to push it through very quickly, but he would like to give time for the Virginia Beach City Council to come up with, in his words, something more realistic and reasonable than the current scheme of the short-term rentals. So with that, I will turn it back over to you for any questions and then also uh, for any direction. Uh, as I mentioned, the there's a, it's sort of a funnel. We're starting out with all of these. And so we're going to end up, some of these may not even make it out of committee, um, but I, I was just seeking your direction and I plan to do this on a regular basis for you to tell me if there's anything else that you want the city to take an official position on. Thank you very much. Council, people, and if I could recommend, ask all your questions pertaining to everything at one time, 
you know, so this way we don't have to have that back and uh, forth um, logistical inconvenience that we go through sometimes. Mr. Tower. I apologize to everyone, to Debbie and everyone, but I could not understand their comments about Delegate Davis's bill. Could you repeat them in summary form, please, your comments, please, Debbie? Thank you. Okay, sorry, I was muted. So uh, Delegate Davis for House Bill 1031, um, he, he has not given me uh, the reasoning for that or the impetus for it. I do have a meeting with him tomorrow morning for that. Um, but other than that, uh, I have not heard. I understand from our school's lobbyists that there's a backstory, um, and I don't know what that is yet. Uh, I was after this meeting, then I will be meeting with our um, CJ uh, Stolly, our other lobbyist, who is meeting with him right now. So that uh, I can find that out and get that information to you this evening. Okay, is that all, Guy? Uh, questions? Yeah, M Mr. Moss. With regards to the uh, grocery tax, I assume that's was be, it will be referred to JLARC or someone will be doing the financial analysis. Is is that correct? And do we know about when in the session's time frame that would would come out? Uh, so, Mr. Moss, yes, uh, it's been referred to both the finance committees, but it is my understanding that the grocery tax is not something that's going to go quickly. It's going to undergo several different revisions. There's a full analysis that, uh, as you said, has to be done and also has to be, um, we need to understand where those funds will be coming from if the localities will be held harmless through the grocery tax and how they're going to do that. So, um, it's my understanding that is not one of the quick rollers. So. Uh, any input on that um, is, is good from uh, the city standpoint, but I, that's when I foresee you getting weekly updates on as to where it went. Anyone else? Mr. Berlucci. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and um, thank you, Ms. Bryan. I have an um, issue I'd like to raise that wasn't uh, part of your presentation, but I would like to submit it to the council for consideration and possibly, Ms. Bryan, if you could provide any guidance about whether or not it would be still be possible for the city to take a position on this. And that's in reference to the constitutional ban on same-sex marriage. Um, my understanding from this is that there is uh, legislation which requires reenactment um, and it was passed, it was adopted last year by both the House and the Senate and is working its way through the General Assembly again and requires this reenactment that will repeal the constitutional uh, ban on same-sex marriage affirming the right to marry to all Virginians. Um, so it would effectively redefine um, the prohibition that marriage is only a union between one man and one woman. And this is important because the United States Supreme Court um, stated that this was um, not constitutional in the Overfell case. And so, um, there is an exemption for religious organizations and clergy who would not be required in their religious capacity to perform any marriage, but this um, provision would extend the constitutional right to marry to all Virginians, and I think it's important that the city take a position on this. And so I'd like to bring that forward as an amendment to our legislative agenda. Okay, Ms. Bryan, any uh, feedback? So Council Member Berlucci, I think you did a, an excellent job summarizing that. Um, that's exactly what it is. Basically, uh, it repeals the prohibition. And uh, in all of um, what I've seen so far on it, it also mentions the Supreme Court case and uh, mentions that it could be uh, ruled as um, not constitutional the way it stands, but that it is, it is in. I haven't seen any activity on it yet. It was just introduced, and I did read that about it um, last evening. And You've summarized it. That's basically the all it would do is repeal the prohibition and take us back to um, same sex marriage being legal in the state of Virginia. Um, and if there's any position statements, um, I can bring those forward in committee. I don't know if that one has been um, taken in committee yet, but I can look that up and get that information for you. I could just make one other comment. I just I thank you, Ms. Bryan, because my position is that this. Um, Prohibition is discriminatory, and I think that the largest city in the Commonwealth of Virginia should lend the full weight 
in support of uh, protecting all Virginians from discrimination. And so I would defer to the, uh, Mr. Stiles and Mr. Johaney for what the process would be to bring that uh, forward as an amendment to our legislative agenda. I believe the uh, council's practice in prior years was to have it drafted, to bring it forward and have public comment on it before uh, adopting it. And I think that would be appropriate. Okay, anyone else at this point for Ms. Bryant? Mr. Moss. I wanna ask about uh, HB 1059. This is the temporary reduction in the gas tax suspension of the state gasoline tax. Um, I'm sure that, that will also have a financial analysis, I assume, and that we will understand from HR tax, HR tax, excuse me, what that means to them, and also some kind of idea of what it, what it really translates to in terms of uh, benefit to the uh, actual consumers. What, did that also get referred to finance? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Moss, I believe that it did. And also that one as a policy decision, again, just like the grocery tax, that one's going to be a little slow moving. Um, both VML and VACO and all of the other agencies here have all uh, started pulling uh, their individual jurisdictions on what it will mean to them. So that's another one that um, I, that and the grocery tax, both um, I will add to our watch list because I think those are, will undergo several iterations um, before they get anywhere and both of them will undergo analysis. Ralph. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, if it's the will of council, I hope we would oppose um, House Bill 978, um, HRT state recordation tax funding. I think as we, we've heard from Deborah, and, and thank you, Deborah, for a great job of, of telling us the importance of um, this bill, but we have a dedicated uh, source of funding for Hampton Roads Transit throughout our region. Um, that is something that um, if this bill was to go forth, it, it would uh, eliminate. And as we already know and understand, um, Northern Virginia um, takes the, the lion's share of transit funding um, from our state. And, and so I would hope we would uh, oppose this bill. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rouse. And Mr. Rouse is our representative on HRT. And I think we could all agree that public transportation has to be a priority, at least going forward in terms of uh, you know, we can use the funding and we're going to need some help to do it. So thank you, Mr. Rouse. Yeah, Mr. Moss. I just had a question. Following the question and answers, are we going to have a discussion on these items? Or is this the time Yeah, that, this questions? is, you know, just back just and forth questions. here. Just the question. I have no more further questions. Thank okay. you. Okay. Okay. All right. I, I think that'll do it. Uh, Ms. Bryan, thank you very much for carving some time out to at least get us uh, up to speed on some of this stuff. And uh, I guess there's a dynamic flow going on up there. Mr. Dehaney. Uh, yeah, Mr. Mayor, just want to get a sense of, does council want us to take any positions on these items? Because if um, okay. we can, you know, based on where things are going right now, if we close up right now, the direction I'm hearing that's going to um, Deborah is to not take a position on these unless council lets us know if they want us to take a position on any of okay. these. Okay, would we would like some discussion on this? Okay, Mr. Tower. Well, we have a, a short-term rental scheme in place in the city that we have spent months and months and had many, many public hearings on to let it be overrun by state action without defense of it is unacceptable as far as I'm concerned. And I hope our lobbies will be instructed to use every available means to try to defeat this. Having said that, I have no problem whatsoever trying to work with Senator Steph or anyone else uh, if, if, if we can come up with something productive. But I think our position is so freshly done that uh, um, I, I hope we will defend it. You know, if, if Mr. Ma, is, are you, are you going to speak to that? Yeah. Okay, please. Well, I would concur with Mr. Tower. I, kn I know Senator Steph well. I know he always speaks like he doesn't likes to treat everyone the same and I and I agree he doesn't he's not a big person on subsidies I'm not either but I think in this instance we are treating everyone the same everybody who has an entitlement under our current residential zoning 
gets the same consideration as everybody else who has an entitled use. When it comes to conditional uses, we are treating everyone who comes after a conditional use, whether it's gun sales, whether it's rescue pets, or whether it's a child care, we look those folks and we look at how do we best what put conditions that mitigate what could turn out to be adverse consequences for the surrounding community so i really believe our argument here is that we are not infringing on anyone's property rights with our strs we are finding a way that allows people to under certain circumstances and conditions and regulations to get a use of their property that they otherwise are not entitled to have. And that's an important distinction. And I, do, I couldn't speak more to, uh, Mr. Wood was here, I'm sure he would, would <laughs> what I'm saying, we have spent years, not just a few years, but years and much political capital on everyone's part to find the thing that, that works. And, and I would hope that in our conversations, and I'm hoping I've got my calls in the center to Steph, that all of us would uh, think that what we have in place is good for the community. We got to tell our, our positive story about it and, uh, and then try to really find out what really is that if there is a space that we can get there, we, I'm like, Mr. Tower, we should try to close it. But uh, we fought long and hard to build a community consensus and this takes us back to uh, at that podium every night, re redoing this thing and just creating a, a division in our community where we have achieved a sense of harmony, at least in my opinion. Okay. At this point, does anybody object to us going forward to uh, oppose this? Do we have consensus that we will move forward? Mr. Rouse. I, I think it's, it's no secret how, how I feel about short-term rentals um, as, as well. I, I would like to, to if, if we could, I'd like to learn more about uh, Senator Steff Bill and how he uh, how he brought it for. Um, I think Councilman Moss and Councilman Tower are absolutely right. We we have no one wants to reopen short term rentals. It's been <laughs> it's been a long discussion. But I also understand that we it took years to get to something five or six years to get to something where it was agreed upon by the, the community at large, and then we just changed it not too long ago. Um, and so I, I'm interested to know more about the the start of this bill and how Senator and staff, um, you know, what, what's the thought behind it before I take a position on it? Okay, that, that's great. And if it's okay, Mr. Rouse, uh, we'll ask Ms. Bryant uh, to m move forward and just let him know that in general, uh, there was great concern by the council and, uh, you know, some and pushback to it, but uh, it would be great if we have further clarification. Would that be fair? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. All right, and let's just uh, go through this very quickly here. Um, and, and, uh, the feelings of uh, the body on the grocery tax. Mr. Mayor, for the grocery tax, I don't necessarily know if we need, a, Deborah, let me know if you're wrong, let me know if I'm wrong here, but I don't necessarily know if we need anything. To support it or not, okay. Right at this moment, because I think there's a, several other, go ahead, Mr. Moss wants to say something, obviously, I defer to Mr. Moss. Okay, so at this point, you know, we'll just, so, you know. Mr. Moss, Mr. Mr. Moss and Ms. Henley. You know, um, I, I hope all of you had a chance. I had to watch it on rebroadcast because I was camping on Monday, but I watched the governor's statement to the General Assembly, his address, and I, have a t I got a hard copy of his text. And uh, I think he talked about how the city, the state's revenues over the biennium were up over any forecast by $2.6 billion. And the grocery tax is truly a regressive tax and has the most adverse consequences on those people who are struggling the most in our in our community. And I think, as I heard, and that's some of the things I've spoken with folks, he's using and some of that redirecting some of that growth revenue to be the offset for this tax. I don't know where the council is, but I am personally, as a council member, just on my own, I am highly supportive. I do think that he talked about the cost of government and what's happening to ordinary citizens. And ordinary citizens are doing poorly while the state revenues are doing well and they're disconnected. And we need to correct that disconnectedness and have substantial tax relief for our ordinary uh, working families in the, in the state. So I'm personally, I don't know how they're gonna get there, but I'm in favor of principle and I will be communicating my own support for this uh, reduction of this tax. And if it means we have less spending, you know what? 
families are hurting a lot worse than local governments are, and the revenue flow shows it. And I think that the citizens uh, need to uh, receive some of that benefit. And that's just my my view, but I wanted to share it. So uh, perhaps, Mr. Dehaney, the act with this particular one, if each individual council person would like to communicate uh, their support for it or concerns, you know, they go ahead and do that. Okay, Ms. Henley. I would just like to uh, request that we have sort of a an ongoing accumulated report of all of these changes in taxation. Uh, anything that the state is doing that's going to reduce the tax income, because you know we're seeing conversation here about the local taxes, and I just don't think we can do any of this piecemeal. We've got to know the total. And, you know, as we're getting ready to go into our budget, um, I don't think, I mean, I think we better kind of watch out because if we don't keep track of it, we are going to not know where we stand. So I think we really need to have an ongoing accounting so we know exactly where we stand with what the state has done, if the federal does anything, before we know what we're going to be able to do so we don't lose track and then find out we've made a big mistake okay mr moss i i couldn't agree more with mrs henley which is why i know that also the governor talked about making record investments in public education in his speech which was one of the few things where there was bipartisan standing ovation for anybody who watched it and so which is why i've been saying all along that we should take all these requests even those coming from the school board for reversion funds and do, making all those decisions comprehensively, not one-on-one, -on -one, but comprehensively during our budget cycle, because then we'll know the state will have adjourned, they will have adopted a budget, we will know the pluses and minuses, and then we can then look and say, what really, out of all this money we think we have, do we still have as a surplus or not? So I think that's why I believe any major decision that and none of that stuff with the school board was time critical because some of that stuff was even going into next year's budget. They're just trying to preload it with the city manager that we just comprehensively deal with all those actions at one time and it isn't prejudicial to anybody's current year execution. That's just my thoughts, but I do concur with Mrs. Henley's assessment about knowing all the puts and takes. Okay, Mr. great. Mr. Mayor, I guess, yes. could I think one more following up on Mr. Ross's comment? Um, I'm, I'm was not able to attend last week's meeting, but I did watch it all, um, and I, w I had the, exactly the same. What I would, what I've not heard is any offset or pushback to Mr. Moss's statement about can't we consider these all and do them? I mean, to me, that makes a world of sense. I just would like to hear from the city side, I, I, I and, and the schools, although. I, other, uh, why can't we do that? Well, give me, you know, give, give me a good reason why we can't do that. Otherwise, I'm in complete support of that. I'm not sure what the, how the wheels grind uh, exactly to do that, but mm -hmm. obviously we make better decisions if we've got all the information in front of us. Uh, up to a point, we have to make some decisions on the run, but is this, is this one or not? I, I, I'll put the ball in your court, Mr. City Manager, if I can. Kevin, come on up, because I'll start, but Kevin, I may need you to clean up for me. I, it's council's direction. If council wants us to bring all this as part of um, the budget cycle, I think that's something we can figure out a way to do it if council wants us to do if, that. I mean, I'm perfectly willing to hear it's putting mm -hmm. a, too much, a big strain on us. We can do it, but it is putting a big stress on us. You know, we'd be think, better off. To, I, I'm just yeah, open to hearing I what think you guys have to we say. Would, we would, um, um, we would, we would ask that specific question to the school, um, the school staff, the school superintendent, but from, from Kevin, let me know if I'm wrong, but if council wants us to do that, we can figure out a way to make it work in the budget till we get to count, till we take it up to this part of the budget cycle and have, um, and council give us direction on how they want us to move forward in a holistic way with a bird's eye view of everything. So if that's the direction, we can do that. We'll talk to the schools to get a sense of what actually grinds down, like how you said, to see if there's a material impact and then we'll we'll update council accordingly but 
if that's what council wants us to do, we can figure out a way to get it done. W would council be open to make that a direction at this point? Does anybody object to it? We can take it, Mr. Mayor, we can take it as the intended direction subject to any other prevailing conversation or information that says that something's going to fall, the, the sky's going to fall, should that happen. So sure. we can, I mean, if you mm -hmm. expect you to bring that back to us, okay. if that's the, so the we'll, case. We'll right. try to get you that information. The Friday package, if the Friday package is too um, quick, we'll try to get it to you by next Tuesday at the latest. Mm -hmm. and, okay. Mr. Mayor, uh, so just to clarify one of the things, so um, the request that came forward from schools not only has just been the typical process in the previous years in the past of okay at the end of the closeout they bring forward a reversion but it's also part of the school funding formula policy uh, between the schools city and schools so um, they're just following the policy and putting together so it is certainly it is not anything in my understanding at this point in time is not anything that's time sensitive that's going to be punted out um, or impacted negatively impacted if immediate action is not taken However, we will all reach out with schools and double check that um, and get something in the future Friday packet. Okay. Okay. Are we satisfied? Yeah, good, good suggestions, Mrs. Henley and Mr. Moss. Okay. Uh, next on to, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Rouse's recommendation concerning the HRT money for the $20 million for mm -hmm. Hampton Roads. Yeah. Mr. Mayor, this is one where we would need some kind of, if your council wants us to do something, they should let us know. If not, we're just going to continue to not say anything. Okay. Does everybody understand that? Okay, good. And then uh, I guess uh, Mr. So, Dick. Mr. Uh, Mayor, so council telling us, so I'm not hearing anything. So basically, Deborah is not going to give any opinion one way, shape, or form on a position on this. And that's perfectly fine for the, um, the HRT state rec recordation tax funding. Mr. Moss, and then Mr. Bellucci, then Mr. Tower. Well, I don't support it and never have. I do think that this body as a whole, I would suspect they would be in support of our opposition, but I still would dislike. I've always believed that that recordation tax was a tax on our citizens. That is, because that's how it gets paid. And only, but then we still had to cough up the $5 million. So in effect, we had a net increase that we had to put into public transportation. My, my disagreement with this bill has always been is, once you're independent, the customer and the payer relationship, provider relationship was broken. And we're now having, I'm all in favor of paying for it, all the public transportation that our citizens want to pay for and paying that bill directly. But when people, when you break the nexus between the, you get health insurance. When you break the nexus between the person paying and the person who's getting service, they can deliver service that we might not want, but they have money. So they now have their, that's, and I think having a, de HRT having a dependent relationship with all of its customers where they have to satisfy their needs and pay for the service they get is a better, a less, uh, communal commercial transaction than where the customer gets to decide what they want to pay for it, they pay for it, and if they don't want to pay for it, they don't. And, um, and I think when you break that relationship, you get decisions that aren't always in the best interest of the taxpayers who have to pay it. And if they wanted to go that route, then they, they should come up with and make it a more clean thing. But uh, the places that have the most commercial transactions pay the most, right? That's how it works for residential agenda. There's nothing scientific or customer or user fee related about that way they're paid. And I think when you have that disconnection, you get, uh, in the long run, uh, less than economically efficient decision making. And that's my opposition. But I know where this body stands. I don't take any exception or fault for coming up a different conclusion. It's just not one that I share. Okay. So, Mr. Dehaney, your suggestion is maybe just let it go with the flow or? Well, if so I know staff has a couple inputs. I think the budget director and also the public works director has a couple in, couple inputs. What I'm looking for is this. I can, I can leave it alone, but if council wants me to oppose it or support it, let us know. But there may be some information that the budget director and the, um, an LJ, our public works director, can add that can give council as much information as possible. LJ, you want to come up first? Or the input.
Welcome. Afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Manager, for giving me the opportunity. I, I think this bill is a little bit confusing uh, because of the, the mention of the recordation taxes. So prior to the passing of House Bill 1158, I believe it was a couple of years ago, um, Hampton Roads Regional Transit did not have a dedicated funding source. Their funding came through gas taxes and recordation taxes that go to the state. Um, that money, uh, as was mentioned by Deborah, was divvied up amongst all of the transit agencies in the state. Uh, Northern Virginia did have a carve out for themselves, but everybody else basically split the money up. With House Bill 1158, and again, I apologize if I'm getting the House Bill incorrect, it created the Hampton Roads Regional Transit Fund. That Hampton Roads Regional Transit Fund added an additional uh, recordation fee and also additional room occupancy fees to create the Hampton Roads Regional Transit Fund. But it also took $20 million as a carve out from the state's share of the recordation fee. So I, I just wanted to make sure the council's aware that, that the money that is at play in the bills that are being proposed is not the, the city's share that is going, it is from the state's original share. And I just wanted to make sure the city council was aware of that $20 million, where that's coming from. Mr. Moss. I want to thank you for that clarification because you really can't decipher that from this narrative. And that's important. And uh, I do think that we would be wise, as long as we're going to have this less than economically efficient system in place and this bill isn't changing that underlying foundation of local financing, we probably should oppose because otherwise we have to replace this money. That would be my deduction from what I just heard. And thank you very much. Okay. Anyone else? Mr. Mr. Yeah. Tower. Yeah. 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 Mr. Mayor. Mr. Tower, can Kevin give his? He'll he'll be quick, and then after that, you can. I just you may want this sure. information. Uh, yep. Yeah. Come right here. Mm -hmm. um, so as LJ had just talked about with the uh, recordation, um, whenever this did go into place, uh, it was actually a loss of revenue to the city of two million dollars so lj is correct that it was a sweep statewide that created this pool of resources um, and there was individual little buckets out there that were remitted and the localities got to keep in terms of the, within their general fund whenever this was passed uh, that resulted in about two million dollars um, being reduced from the city's general fund um, and that's part of what makes up that 20 million dollar bucket um, that HRT utilizes for its um, transportation services. Okay, Mr. Tower. Yeah, I just n a note, I know that there were some people in the resort industry who were opposed to the, w whatever the number is of the bill that, that instituted the current system because they didn't see the <coughs> connection between local public transit, which is not used extensively by hotel mm -hmm. guests and uh, and the, and the revenue source. But one, having said that, and once it's in place, undoing that at this point seems to me to be not good for Hampton Roads or Virginia Beach, uh, uh, with all deference to Mr. Moss's analysis of the, which, with which I don't disagree, of, of the wisdom of using these kinds of taxes uh, in this way. Uh, sometimes you have to kind of work with what you got. I, I don't, I think we generally ought to be opposed to it as opposed to taking no position. That's my, that's my feeling. I think, I don't think it helps Virginia Beach to go back to where we were. That's my analysis. Mm -hmm. but. Okay. Anyone else? Ms. Henley. Well, <clears throat> it's just the reality of, of transit and, and the need that a lot of people have for a public transit system. Um, is is there and cannot be denied um, and there will probably have to be some kind of subsidy in order to provide no a public transit system that's just the reality because there are people who need it and need it desperately if they're going to be able to work if they're going to be able to get to a doctor if they're going to be able to do things and it's just where do we want to get it from and if this has been in place and it's working I, I you know, if we take it away, we could wind up being worse off. But I'm just thinking of the users who just have to have it and need it. And 
if it's not this, then it's going to have to be something else, or we're not going to be able to provide this service, which is so desperately needed by a lot of people. Okay, Mr. Moss. Well, well, I still don't buy into, as I said before, I retracted my opposition to this particular bill, but I have recommended on several occasions, and I will do again, though HRT didn't like it, is why don't we find out what the cost is for a single year to make transit free? No 30% fair collection, eliminate the people who do all the county, eliminate, and let's just see if transit was free is the cost barrier. I think public transit makes sense if it's used. And people say, well, it's, it's the barrier, it's the fare box, it's this, it's this. Well, let's start eliminating some of these barriers in a pilot program. But when I brought that to HRT's attention, they said, oh my goodness, it would take us two years to implement that. We gotta do this, we gotta do this. This gets back to Governor Yunkin's point. We gotta be business efficient, not government stretch out. But I still think that that is, that just having this money, and you look at how it's being spent, and then see, is it moving the transit ridership needle any? It's not. It's not moving the needle. So if our purpose is moving the needle and actually having an impact that makes it more available, then where do we test that concept? I know we've been delayed on the, because of COVID, the one that we did do, and when we recommended we would pay the fare box, what did they come back and say? They wanted people to pay. Even when we, so I think, and I know Mr. Ralph, I know you'll take this back, but they've got to change their mindset too if we're trying to really find out what moves the needle on transit, then we got to move out of the traditional, the, why the customer, if we're trying to say that there's barriers, and that's the case where they came back and said, no, they wanted to collect money at the fare box. I'd never understood that, mm -hmm. but I hope you'll take that thought process back to them. But that's what I think. This isn't about how much we spend. This is getting an effect for what we spend. And I'm challenging that, that there is a mindset that has to change to get more effect for the money that we're already spending. Yeah, Mr. Rouse. I would say, uh, Mr. Moss, your, 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 your comments and, um, is, is hitting home because um, as vice chair of HRT, this is something we have discussed, is making um, transit free within um, Ham Hampton Roads. There's a, a study, I believe, where, and it's still ongoing discussion. We're going to take actual look at that because Richmond Transit has actually, I think, has gone free fare. And so we're trying to look at how, how is those funding can go um, be in place. But one of the other things about, you know, and not to belabor the point, um, what this money has helped HRT do is um, 14 regional commuter and express limited st um, stop bus routes connecting major employment centers like the shipyards and Terra, the oceanfront and downtown areas. Um, over 50 new bus shelters have already been installed and 150 more are on tap over the next 12 months, um, which includes shelters, benches, solar lighting, lighting and trash receptacles. Um, and then also when you, you talk about um, buses and ridership, 24 new buses have, have just been purchased um, with uh, in total and will be delivered by July of this year. So this money is, is extremely important for um, our, our regional transit. And as Councilwoman Henley has, has noted, um, public transit is, is very, very um, in, important um, to to our, our public and especially to our, our region. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yep. And if I could just say, you know, uh, you know, we had a lot of discussions on this on the Hampton Roads uh, Planning District uh, and the transportation uh, group. And one of the biggest barriers uh, to really a successful system is that I guess each city was its own fiefdom in a lot of ways and paid based on their ridership and needs. But the problem has come when people from Chesapeake and Suffolk have to get to Virginia Beach somehow or uh, one of the biggest problems they have. And the mayor of um, Suffolk was saying that, you know, that they have people that could work in Newport News, but trying to get them, you know, to get there. So there's an overall problem that we have to look at. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, Mr. Uh, Rouse is going to be on the, the right path. And, I, you know, I concur with, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Moss, and, you know, go ahead and, uh, you know, try to make it free. But you know, I, I was talking to a guy that owns a restaurant on, um, you know, out on, uh, you know, first, uh, you know, uh, first colonial, 
and um, you know he can't get employees to his restaurant with the current routes just can't do it and uh, so once again I think you know we got to deal with that from uh, a basis now but I think at least you know this was a robust discussion and I think we're ready to yeah so mr. mayor so what I'm hearing is it sounds like the and then I could be wrong and if I'm wrong just let me know but what I'm hearing it sounds like council wants is in support of us directing our um, lobbyists and Deborah for opposing this uh, HR House Bill 978 at this time that we're okay with opposing. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is that concurrence? Cool. Okay. And okay. Mr. Mayor, the last item from what I'm hearing here is that y'all do, council does not have enough information to give a decision one way, shape or form on this one. So Deborah is gonna, gonna get some more information and we plan to make this a every week cadence because this is policy and we need your guidance in order for us to take any action on it. So Deborah's gonna get some more information on this and then whatever else comes up during the week, we'll try to get to you next Tuesday and if not, if it's more pressing, we'll try to get to you earlier. And then Mayor, we hijacked your calendar, your agenda, and we put you all behind. So Mr. Moss and Mr. Jones, do you feel any particular way if we will move the stormwater regulate regulatory update to a workshop next week so I can't have more time? Get out what you're saying. Okay. So Mr. Moss and Mr. Jones, item number C, the stormwater regulatory update. Is there any issue if we move that to a the workshop next week so we can have more time to talk it out with council? I think that's an excellent suggestion. Uh, mm -hmm. Plus it gives the members more time to read the comments and if they want to reach out to people in the community who made those comments and get behind it. And hopefully they would then be able to have their questions or clarifications submitted prior to the workshop, then the workshop itself could be more productive. So okay. I have no problem with that whatsoever. Great. Well, Mr. Mayor. Yes. I, I, actually, I think Ms. Wooten was. Oh, I, I, I just wanted to know, I, I just wanted to know if, if Attorney Deborah Bryan, is she still on the line or she's gone? She gone? I, Deborah's probably still on. She's, she's still, still on. on. I just wanted, can I ask you, Ms. Bryan, can you give me um, some information on HB 1031? Um, just if you could maybe email that information to me. I'd like to know more about it. Thank you, Council Member. Okay, Mr. Bellucci. Thank you, and I'm sorry to, for belaboring the point because I, I, and I wish that I had, um, that I had had a discussion about this earlier, and I, was, I apologize to this body that I didn't. But I just want to make sure that I'm understanding the position that we just took on the um, on H on the HRT issue, and I'm going to go back to the constitutional repeal question, because it seems to me that we've uh, we've making we've made an amendment, we've deviated from our legislative agenda to a degree, in a, a way that um, is different than the legislative agenda that we adopted, and this constitutional repeal is at a critical juncture. And it's very important to a lot of families in Virginia Beach. And so I just want to find out, I want to make sure that the public has a chance to be engaged in the discussion, but I also don't want to miss an opportunity for the largest city in the Commonwealth to weigh in on a very important issue to many Virginia Beach families. And so I would just pose a question to the body, if appropriate, because I think Ms. Ms. Bryan could use some direction, and I certainly could use some clarity and understanding I'm, I'm agreeable to continuing with the process. However, the way I envision that in my mind is it could take weeks in order to do and we may not have weeks to weigh in on a very important discussion. And so I'm wondering if anyone on this body has a problem with Ms. Bryan expressing this council's um, support for the repeal or concerns about the process. Okay, Mr. Moss. Well, I like a general comment. I think what might get us here is a general principle. I think any legislation proposed by any General Assembly member that is in contradiction to an established Supreme Court of the United States decision that that's an unlawful act, I don't care if it's about stormwater, if it's about mask, if it's about marriage, on its face should be opposed because all of us have a duty to what? To uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States. So on its face, while getting public input is important, it's just not legally defensible. So, so in that sense, I don't have a problem with people getting comments, but with my oath that we've taken, 
and that's clearly established what the rule of law is, we're just we're saying we support upholding the, Supreme, the Constitution of the United States as interpreted by the Supreme Court. By default, we're opposing this legislation. I don't have any issue with that because that's my oath, and I've already said I would do that. So for me personally, I don't have any reservations. And thank you. And I don't know if Ms. Bryan needs anything beyond that or if Mr. Dehaney has any. And I don't want to, I'm sorry for taking so much time on this. And I do sincerely apologize because it's really something that through the Human Rights Commission, we should have been more prepared to address. However, um, this is a constitutional question, both for our state and for our country. And it impacts many Virginia, Virginia Beach families. And I think if Ms. Bryan were prepared to address this issue as expeditiously as possible, I think our community would be well served and it would reflect very positively upon the city of Virginia Beach. Okay. Okay, anybody else at this point? Uh, any other clarifications needed, Mr. Dehaney? Not, not at this, this point. point? Okay, I, I think at this point we might be ready to move on. Okay. All right, so Taylor has 10 minutes to give the presentation on the sale of 205 Fort Street and 400 Atlantic Avenue, and that will bring the council back on their agenda. <laughs> man with the silver tongue. <laughs> Good afternoon, May uh, Mayor, Council. Uh, you know, uh, and I just noticed that the pilot has already dropped an article on this before we've even presented it. So uh, <laughs> here we are. Um, I'll, I'll go quickly for, uh, for that, uh, for, uh, just uh, to be cognizant of your time. But here's a, uh, uh, the disclosures relating to this. I'll give you all just a moment to read those and then we'll dive in. Important to note that this, uh, that what we are bringing to you is unchanged since you since you all have last seen it. This is uh, this. You'll see that there are two parcels in question here, uh, on on Fourth and Fifth Street, respectively. We own we own the two parcels on Fourth Street. Uh, we received a letter uh, going back uh, to November 18th of 2020 um, from Mr. Standing for the purchase of the city-owned parcels. And you can see the exact addresses there, 400 Atlantic Avenue and 205 Fourth Street. Um, it's important to note that Mr. C Mr. Standing is the current um, uh, uh, lessee of both of these parcels, and he's using them primarily for valet services associated with commerce at, uh, at, uh, at Waterman's, which we all know, a uh, very busy restaurant on the south end of the beach. Mr. Standing also um, owns the parcel that's at 213 Fifth Street, also operating it as a as a uh, as a parking lot for his restaurant, and what we're trying to do here is to uh, develop uh, a residential project at 213 Fifth Street. But there's the need for a long-term parking solution to accommodate um, the ongoing, basically ongoing need for valet services <coughs> at the restaurant, but also uh, overflow parking things of that nature from the development. Here again is the aerial view. You can see that this is a single parcel. That is um, uh, that is surrounded by existing development there by the little the little cul-de-sac as you approach the loop. One of the things I, I will clear up the uh, um, just because I, I had a moment to glance at the article in the pilot regarding um, other proposed uses of this of the uh, of the area of Rudy uh, on or around Rudy Loop that have been in the public over the past few years. And it's important to note that what we're talking about here is not part of any of those conversations. I just want to clear that up for the public right away. This is uh, this is not part of that conversation. Um, Mr. Standing's initial offer was to purchase the property from us for 1.7 million, as is our, as you often ask us to do. We had the, the property appraised as 1.83 million, is what. Uh, that's a that's a May of 2020 appra um, appraisal, and we don't anticipate that there will be a uh, um, any 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 issue in, in in receiving the full appraised value for this. And uh, um, and it's important to note that Mr. Standing would continue um, to uh, to operate um, the uh, the valet service <coughs> in Waterman's um, with partial offsite on uh, you know on Fifth Street from development of this parcel. I want to show you a couple of of images here. As, as to what it could be looking what we could be looking at although it's important to note everything that we, that I'm going to show you here and uh, that the public's going to see here is conceptual in nature we have not seen mr. standings designs we just wanted you and the public to have an idea of the type of and the scale of investment that we could be talking about here and so here's a quick look at our fifth street site um, here is what would be we call that a mid-rise option and it's important that we don't know 
from a stormwater standpoint, we don't know how many park. We don't. We, there are a lot of things that we that we don't know that should you all because obviously, we never want to get ahead of this body. So um, we're not. We've sort of done this for illustrative purposes, but it's important to note that um, we've not done anything formal on this site because you've not told us to do that yet, and you've not told us of your intent one way or the other to sell or not sell the property. But these are just, uh, this is a conceptual drawing of what it could look like. You can see this is a nice mid-rise development. Would be a significant add to the tax base, even at mid-rise. I mean, then we have a high-rise option, which, which again, you can see, we wanted to, um, as we were looking at the art of the possible, we wanted to see what high-rise looked like simply because you'll see from a, from a height and look standpoint, there are plenty of um, mid to high-rise properties in the area already. And so we thought it was worth looking at sort of um, at, at two options and what and how that might mass on the site. Um, what's before you today is consideration as to whether you would like us to move forward um, with the uh, with the offer that we have received from uh, from Mr. Standing as as is um, traditionally our process and what you all have told us we would if you told us to come back the next step would be public hearings and then with a with subsequent votes. Um, uh, to potentially sell the property to Mr. Standing for this development. With that, I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions? Okay, I guess we need to cancel direction at this point. Yeah. Yes, Mayor. Yeah. Okay, um, at this point, um, does anybody object to moving forward with selling to Mr. Standing uh, the 4th Street parcel for the value of 1.83? Any objection? Well, have we heard from the Resort Advisory Commission We're here from the public at all yeah. on this? It, so, yeah, this, so this is yeah. all, this is all subject to public yeah, comment. Yeah, there, there will be a public comment, and every, this is just a thing to move forward. With, that, correct. That's right. So, Mayor, yes, that that's accurate. So, this is this is a this is the first anyone in the public has heard of this council member, and so uh, so yes, we're happy to do what to gather whatever public input you all need. Um, uh, either now or as we go through the process going forward, but this is an introductory briefing for the public, so we're happy to go wherever you send us. But no, sir, the RAC has not heard about this directly from us. Okay, so we'll assume that you know that's going to be a necessary ingredient. Well, I think that's what they're there for. Yeah. Um, no, that would be good, but yeah, you know, but I think right now we're just looking for a council consensus to you know give a green light to at least move forward. With the understanding there will be a thing. I don't personally. I don't have an, any objection to this to this pro, uh, uh, selling the property, but I, I, I think you, uh, Mr. Branch is right, and that is we should before we move forward with putting it on the agenda or entering into a contract, we probably ought to have some input from the resort advisory. I think that's a prudent idea. Anybody have a problem with that? Mr. Moss? Well, I don't think the RAC has any more standing than any citizen who lives in Well, Green I agree with the public as well. I said, that's so I think I have the public comment, but I think our direction he was asking for was to proceed with the process that gets us to the public comment, not saying that we had made a commitment to sell. Yeah, well, that's fine. And that's what I thought he was asking. Yeah, yeah, but yes, what sir. I wanted to clarify is in all this discussion is that this would be part of the public comment, I think is no one's asking us to provide any tax subsidy, co-partnering, or anything. This is all totally private capital, all private capital expense, correct? Okay, Council Member, that's accurate. Okay, I just think that's an important part of any public comment process. They're <laughs> going to want to know, is there a, a, a hidden dollar somewhere that coming from it, us? That's just, that's important. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Uh, Mr. Yeah, Mr. Tower. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to delay this, but since it's in my district, I just wanted to, to to uh, make sure people understand I am affirmatively in favor of moving ahead with this project as we have just discussed. I think it, it presents a good economic development opportunity for the city with one of our uh, most solid commercial citizens and uh, the public will have plenty of ch and including the RAC will have plenty of chance opportunity to comment before we take any steps that uh, were irreversible. Thanks. Okay. All right, anyone else? Okay, I guess Thank it's you, okay to move forward with the understanding that there will be an open process. Yes, sir. Okay. 
Okay, thank you. And uh, we're going to hold off on the stormwater regulatory, so we'll get right now into council comments, discussion, initiatives, Any anybody. Yeah, Mr. Bellucci. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I just want to take an opportunity to um, to share my reflections because I watched over the weekend, as I know all of you did, with really horror when we watched the situation in Texas unfold at the synagogue. And I think that what we saw in Texas is a reflection of what appears to be an increase of anti-Semitic terrorism, even in this country and around the world. And I have heard from a number of um, members from the Jewish community expressing concern um, for the safety of their community, not only, not specifically in Virginia Beach, but as part of a global trend. And I think it's uh, very important that we not be complacent and that we do be vigilant. One, in taking a stand against what is really disgusting behavior because every person has a right to safety and to practice their faith and peace and security, but also to remain vigilant in um, protecting communities from acts of violence. And I did have a chance to reach out to our chief of police um, who assured me that our police department is conducting additional patrols around vulnerable faith community centers and also is working with them and federal partners to um, provide a sense of comfort as much as possible. Um, but I just, so I, I wanna thank our police department for engaging in that really important activities and also encourage um, continued community engagement um, in support of the Jewish community and, and every faith community in Virginia Beach. Great, thank, thank you. you. Anybody else? You know, with that being said, uh, let me just point out that, you know, we have a very vibrant Human Rights Commission that we've had for a not long time, and the police are always really proactive at the meetings and listening and, you know, determining, you know, the, uh, you know, in, which is inclusive of all different and variety of groups. Yeah, Mr. Moss. Uh, two things. One, it reminded me today as I was filing my financial economic statement, conflict of interest thing, that when it says, what position do you hold? Well, until de December 31st of 2022, my position is a council member at large, because there is no implementation of the district system until on January. There's an election, but our offices don't hold. And it gets me back, and maybe we can have this discussion, maybe an open session, but I was trying to, here is, when we go out and tell people about what their district they live in, are we, are we transitioning out of our offices? And then we're gonna say, oh, that Mr. Moss is in District 8, but in reality, my official legal thing is still at large. How we how we working that, you know? Because I'm always concerned about the appearance. If we're going to send out and spend money to notify people what district they live in before the precincts are known, that's one thing. If you put people's name on it, people then think you're what the appearance of that you're doing incumbent advertising. And so, I, I just don't. I want us to consciously know what we're doing, and I would prefer that we not do that. But I think it's at some point. I'm not saying it has to be today, Mr. Mayor. Is are we transitioning? on one January of 2023? Or are we really saying that we're gonna somehow administratively change before then? I think that'll be confusing for residents, but I think when we come back to this 60,000, we really kind of need to know that we're, it's nameless and it's just what district you live in and we will continue to function in the roles that we have until some of us come back or some of us don't come back, whatever the deal is, and that would be January. But that's just my own thoughts. The last thing I want to pick back is on a comment I made, I guess it will be last Tuesday, or it seems like it was or Tuesday before last maybe, about, um, it'll be Tuesday before last, about the fact that we don't have a unified training program and we don't train, if we're going down, the, we don't train sheriffs and police officers the same. I realize we probably can't do that in one budget cycle, but I know the police department's been talking about for some time about needing a new training location and a bigger site. But I would hope, and I'm sure Mr. Danny took notes to that effect, that 
if it's one fight, one force, then we really ought to be, we can have more frequent academies, we're on a different cycle, a bigger facility. I would hope that at least we'd have the preliminary thoughts of that in our, on, on our budget process. And I do know that the governor made note that he was putting aside $26 million if he gets it out of the General Assembly for communities that increased their funding for police departments. Uh, we were one of those few communities that did that. And training was a big part that he talked about in that conversation in his address. So maybe there's a, a, an avenue to get first place. And it was nice that he did acknowledge the charter school at Green Run, which Glenn had a big part to play in that, Glenn Davis did. So congratulate him on, on that. But I just want to make sure that that is, we take advantage of those two things because I think those are, are force multipliers in the long run. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Anyone else? Yeah, Ms. Wilkie. Thank you. At first, I, I would like to just follow up on the comments from Council Member Berlucci. Um, I was watching yesterday the news, um, very concerned and in horror what happened at the Jewish synagogue in Texas. Really, really concerned me. And to hear uh, members of the Jewish community just really state how important it is, um, as was mentioned, to really be vigilant and to also look at making sure there are laws in place that protect people from these acts of violence and terrorism um, really, really weighed on my heart and um, certainly was concerned because if you cannot have peace in your own place of worship, where can you have peace at? And so I just certainly want to comment on that as well. Um, the other two concerns or the other two items I wanted to make note of, um, this month, is um, the month of January. I wanted to acknowledge um, as Human Trafficking Month. Um, also, I saw Governor Glenn Youngkin sign Executive Order 7 that focuses on the promise to combat and prevent human trafficking and provide support to, uh, to survivors of human trafficking. Uh, I think it's very important to really acknowledge um, that piece of legislation and this month as uh, human trafficking month, that we also make sure that we're vigilant um, and that we're understanding the impact that it has on our region and to ensure that we're always looking for ways to uh, help and support survivors of human trafficking. And then also um, tomorrow, uh, Wednesday, January 19th, is uh, Mental Health Advocacy Day in Richmond, and there will be a virtual uh, seminar from 9 to 12 where legislators and uh, partner organizations will talk, at, talk about priorities concerning mental, mental health. Um, as many of you know, mental health is really a concern, um, has always been a concern, but has really been highlighted as a concern during the pandemic, and we do uh, need to make sure that we're doing all that we can to support people um, who certainly need support uh, and mental health services. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, Mr. Rouse. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I share the, the sentiments of my colleagues, um, Councilman Bellucci and Councilwoman Wooten, um, for our thoughts and prayers with those in the Jewish synagogue and, and how we can make sure um, that all uh, religious and, and backgrounds are protected here in our, not only in our city, but throughout our, our country. Um, one of the other incidents that, that made national news and awareness here at Hampton Roads um, was the news story that came out about our police department um, about uh, inter inter interrogation um, tech um, techniques and strategies. And one of the things that that all that stood out to me as well is the fact that um, Chief Newdegate, you know, upon his arrival here, he saw something immediately did something about it. And so I, I want to commend. Um, Chief Newdegate on that practice, but I also invite um, our, our city manager to uh, provide more clarity on this. I, I've received emails, a lot of calls throughout the community, um, as well as just on uh, on this particular reported incident. Um, and even our, our Vice Mayor um, Wilson spoke to this um, on the news, and I thought she, um, she did a, a great job. Um, being that this is our first time back in council since that news broke, um, I, I just share um, the floor with our city manager just to, um, sh to bring some more clarity to it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rouse. Uh, let me just say at this point, Jermaine, to um, 
you know, Mr. Moss's comments. Yeah, this council is going to have to make a transition over the next couple months, you know, from one type system uh, to another. And I think we have an opportunity coming up, uh, you know, with the retreat, which would give us some time and everything that we could actually come to a consensus on an, a very effective transition and also methods of educating the public, which I'm sure that we're all, you know, you know very interested in. So, but, you know, I really appreciate, you know, the, a lot of uh, the comments that we made today, uh, you know, uh, especially, you know, um, you know, with regard to our community in Virginia Beach to let everybody know that they are valued and safe. So I do thank you. Okay, at this point, Mr. Oh. Jones. Go. Oh, yeah. Uh, Ms., uh, Council, Councilman Barouse, I appreciate the opportunity to give additional clarity. And uh, I think it, it is literally what you said it was. Um, I think everybody um, from myself on to the council really appreciate and supports proactive policing. I think um, when Chief Nudigate became aware of that incident using replica, doc replica documents for interrogation, we just felt that it was um, a bridge too far. You know, definitely nothing illegal happened from talking to the, the city attorney and then looking at um, Supreme Court cases. Nothing illegal happened, you know, so, um, but definitely it was something that was a bridge too far and we didn't think it, it, it is in line with how we would like things handled as Virginia Beach, you know, so the chief is definitely, upon becoming aware of that, stopped the practice and participated fully and completely in the Office of um, Civil Rights. Um, investigation and we are we've already stopped the practice and we've already retrained staff on how things should be done as well and basically all the agreement does is articulates the current direction that the chief already gave after becoming aware of the situation mr. Dehaney thank you for that uh, clarity really appreciate it anybody else okay uh, mr. Jones could you be so kind to do the consent agenda thank you. first uh, under uh Ordinances and resolutions, uh, item J1, uh, ordinance to amend A section 1.3 and 1 30 <coughs> of the Stormwater Management Ordinance, uh, Appendix D, Ray Stormwater Appeals Board, and B section 1.2, Public Works Design Standards Manual, Ray Variances. Consistent with the other action we took, the Two weeks ago, Tuesday, I believe this. Defer. I would recommend this deferred February 1st. Yep. Also, in the condition that we may defer it additionally, depending upon the comments and meetings that I, Mr. I, Jones and I have coming forward. Mr. Moss, that is very prudent advice. Anybody have a problem with that? Okay. We will. Okay. Thank uh, you, Mr. Mayor. Defer till uh, February 1st. All right. Item two resolution to direct the city attorney to file a petition. For writ, writ a special election, or a office of the council member in District 1, formerly District 2, Kipsville. Any? Everybody okay? Everybody okay with that? Okay. Uh, we have speakers on three and four. Number five. Item five, resolution to authorize and direct the city manager to execute a project participation agreement between the city of Virginia Beach and the Southside Network Authority. Everybody okay? Everybody's okay, good. Item six, ordinances to accept and appropriate a $300,000 from the Landmark Foundation to fiscal year 2021-22 public health operating budget, authorized grant, supported positions, Ray Baby Care Program. Everybody okay? Item B, uh, 6B, $547,358 from the Virginia Department of Justice to the fiscal year 2021 22 Commonwealth Attorneys Operating Budget and authorized 25% <clears throat> in grant, in kind grant match by the Commonwealth Attorneys and one grant funded full time position in human services, raised drug treatment. Mr. Court. Yes, Mr. Moss. 
I have posed some questions, the answer of which aren't prejudicial to my vote on this, so I'm supporting it, but I have some follow-on questions, and I still do want those answers. Mm. Not a problem. Okay. Um, Moving on to planning. We're okay on it. All right, I, under planning, Hunt Club Condominium Association, Inc., for a modification of conditions, Ray increased the number of multifamily dwellings by 11 at 120 Laughlin Way, District 1, formerly District 2, Kempsville. Yeah, good. Okay. I'm a no vote. District 2. Mr. Moss is a no yeah, vote. Yeah. Yeah. Item two, Prince Sand Village LLC, Susan Kellum, David E. Kellum, Revocable Trust, Kellum and Eaton Inc., Sisters uh -huh. Two LLC, Charles F. Burroughs the third, and the City of Virginia Beach. Conditional change of zoning from B2 community business, AG1 and AG2, agricultural districts conditional PDH2 plan unit development, R10 residential district and conditional B2 community business districts, Ray development of 73 residential lots with up to 89 dwellings at one commercial parcel at 2369, 2373, 2375, 2381, 2385, Princess Anne Road, 2393, 2401, 2413, North Landing Road, and parcel uh, between 2393, North Landing Road, 2385, Princess Anne Road, District 2, uh, Princess Anne District. Ms. Henley. Um, I have no problem with it. I, I have not heard opposition. But I do think since this is a, a very visible project that we ought to have a presentation and I have expressed that to the attorney and he's aware of it. So I, I really think we need to hear this and, and uh, it's pretty complicated and I think the public needs to know all that's gone into this. I, I think it's a wonderful project. So I'll tell you that before we go into it. So, But if we could spend a few minutes hearing it so the public hears everything that's gone into it. All right. Item three, James D. White, <coughs> revocable living trust for a conditional use permit for a short-term rental at 407 18th Street, Unit A, District 6, Beach District. I just got a note here, the applicant only wants to speak if there's opposition, but you know, the only one speaking so far is Ms. Messner. Mr. Tower. I, I have no objection to being on the consent agenda. Okay. <laughs> Item four. Mr. Mr. Jones, I'm sorry. Mr. Jones, that is um, that would be consent for deferral. The applicant's asking for deferral to February 15th. We just want to make sure that's. Say that again. I'm sorry. That would be consent for deferral. We just want to make sure that's the applicant sent in a request for deferral to February 15th on that item. Three. Our, that's number three. Yes, for number three. Well, yeah, oh, request awesome. a deferral to February 15th. Yeah, I see. Okay. Uh, item 4, 2508 Pacific Avenue, LLC, conditional use permit raise short-term rentals at 2510, 2514, 2518, 2522, 2526, and 2530 Pacific Avenue, District 6, Beach District. Mr. Tower. I have no objection to being on the consent agenda. <laughs> All right. Item five, Ventures LLC for a conditional use permit for a short-term rental at 603 20th Street. <coughs> Excuse me. District 6, Beach District. Mr. Dower. I have no objection to being on the consent agenda. Mayor? Yes. I just think it's good for the viewing public. <clears throat> I know Mr. Howard would probably say, say this as well, that this is in that OR district where we had a talk about that whole situation where it allows for hotels. And this kind of, not to, I mean, we said, I know I said publicly, if you're here, unless there's some big, huge issue, you know, the conditional use permit is like a de facto outcome. 
And I think it does go back to our conversation later with Senator DeStef that we really are treating like properties and like uses despite the zoning the same. So I think this is a case that proves that. I just want to make sure the public hasn't lost the fact that this is an area where a hotel would be a by right use. And that's why we really are supporting these short term rentals. At least I, I am. I won't speak for other people. I'll just say myself. <laughs> Item six, oh, Orp Ventures LLC for a conditional use permit raise short term rentals <coughs> at 410 19th Street, A. Uh, unit 101, 102, 103, 201, 202, and 412 19th Street, units 101, 102, 201, 202, Beach District, Mr. Dowell. Uh, first, let me thank Mr. Moss for his comments. Uh, entirely accurate. I agree with him. Uh, these, these are all in the OR District, uh, all hotel by right. Uh, properties, and I have no objection to their being on the consent agenda. Okay, thank you. Okay, at this point, the chair will entertain a motion to recess into a closed session pursuant to the exemptions from the open meeting allowed by Section 2.237.11a, Code of Virginia, as amended for the following reasons. Legal matters, consultation with legal counsel and briefings by staff, members, or consultants pertaining to actual or probable litigation where such uh, consultation or briefing in an open meeting would adversely affect the negotiation or litigating posture of the public body pursuant to section 2.237.11a7 and that would be Holloway et al. versus uh, City of Virginia Beach and then publicly held property discussions or considerations the acquisition of real property for public purpose or for the disposition of publicly held property where discussion in an open meeting would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiation strategies of the public body pursuant uh, to section 2.237.11a3 and that's district 2 formerly Princess Anne district district um, 2 formerly um, this you know that's a repeat there um, Princess Anne District, District 2, for, uh, formerly Princess Anne District, and District 6, formerly Beach District. And then personnel matters, uh, discussion considerations or interviews of prospective candidates for employment, assignment, appointment, promotion, performance, demotion, salaries, disciplining, or resignation of specific public officers, appointees, or employees of any public body pursuant to section 2.237.11a1, council appointments, uh, council boards, commissions, committee authorities, agencies, and appointees, and appointee evaluations. Okay, do we have a motion? So move. Do we have a second? Second. Vote is open. By a vote of 10 to zero, you've recessed into the closed session. Okay, thank you all very much. We are going to recess into executive. Right.